Okay. Good afternoon and welcome. We are excited to present guest speaker, Abby Cox, who will discuss the costuming and construction of Dangerous Liaison. This program is presented in conjunction with the Bill Blast Fashion Design Speaker Series and the featured exhibition, The Art of the Character, highlights from the Glenn Close Costume Collection. On behalf of the students, staff, and volunteers at the IUS Kanazi Museum of Art, thank you for joining us. My name is Clara, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a museum host and a student studying arts management, and I am super excited to welcome Abby Cox here today. First, we wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington was built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Today's program includes time for questions after the presentation. The program, including the Q&A, is being recorded. For updates of when recordings are released, subscribe to the Museum News through the website. The Art of the Character, highlights from the Glenn Close Costume Collection, is presented in partnership with the Elizabeth Sage Historic Costume Collection and the Sydney and Louis Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture, and Design. The exhibition is cure curated by Kelly Gallett Richardson, curator of the Sage Costume Collection, who is with us today to co-host this program, and Galena Olmsted, assistant curator of European and American art at the Eskenazi Museum of Art. The exhibition is on view through November 14th. At this time, we would like to say a big thank you for the generous support of the exhibition and catalog that was provided in part by the Indiana University Foundations, Wells House Society, and Women's Philanthropy Leadership Council, the Office of the Bicentennial at Indiana University, the Pressman family, Dell, Ellen Leff, and Kimberly and John Simpson. Again, thank you for helping bring this truly spectacular exhibition to life. The accompanying catalog for this exhibition is a beautiful hardback published by Scala Publishers in association with the Eskenazi Museum of Art. The Eskenazi Museum values students and I have the great privilege of introducing today's featured speaker. Abby Cox has been a dress historian, collector and dressmaker for more than a decade. She has an MLIT in decorative arts and design history from the University of Glasgow, Scotland, as well as a BA in art history, history and theater from Indiana University, Bloomington. Currently, she runs her own successful YouTube channel where her content focuses on making dress history and antique clothing more open and accessible. Previously, she was vice president of American Duchess where she co-authored the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking and the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Beauty. She also served as an apprentice milliner and mantua maker at the Margaret Hunter Millinery Shop at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation where she focused on studying, preserving, and reproducing 18th century dressmaking and hairdressing techniques. Please join me in welcoming Abby. Oh, okay. Are we good? Can you guys actually hear me or no? Are you okay if I take this off? I, I promise I won't. I'm, I'm also very well vaccinated. I'm just a little warm. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good afternoon. Um, I hope that you all are doing well uh, today. It's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? It's, it's incredible. Um, and I am so happy to see so many of you all here today. And I am looking forward to meeting so many of you all after we're done talking and hearing your questions. Um, I'm also just really excited to nerd out over to center close with you guys. So here we go. Okay. So for the next about 30 minutes or so, we are going to explore 18th century dress and how the costumes in the 1988 film Dangerous Liaisons relate and compare to original 18th century gown construction. However, in order to have a grounded understanding in 18th century clothing construction, we first need to understand who actually made the clothes in the 18th century. And we also should explore James Atchison's design and construction process with dangerous liaisons, why he set the costumes in the 1760s instead of the 1780s, et cetera. So that's what we're gonna be doing first. Uh, 
I have no idea which one that was actually supposed to be. Nope. Is that slide two? Wait, where am, where am I? Oh, good. Okay. I put like 60 slides in this PowerPoint and I was like, that's probably over Kilcox, but here we go. You can take the girl out of YouTube. Anyways, so, so then after we discuss all of that, we're going to do a comparison of the dark blue sack gown that is actually a copy from the 1756 Boucher portrait of Madame de Pompadour um, to an original gown that's actually held in the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's clothing and textile collection. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll just, I'll say slide. Um, wait. No. So anyways, we'll stay here. It's cool. No, we're fine. <laughs> so, and while this might be actually the YouTuber and me coming out, I do actually want to make it exceptionally clear here that we're not roasting anything today. Okay. This is not that kind of YouTube video. Um, that's not the intention, but what I actually just want to do is just kind of do a comparison because I think it's really interesting to explore the different construction techniques that are used both in historic garments as well as in modern reproductions. Also, Dangerous Liaisons is like one of the best 18th century period films like of all time. So it's like, well, how did they do it? Right? Let, let's find out. Um, okay, so first things first, who made clothes in the 18th century? This cracks me up. I thought that ad was hilarious. Uh, so we're good here, Kelly. Um, it's a common misconception that our ancestors made their own clothing. And this is in part because of our own recent past and how society was affected by the Great Depression, as well as just the general societal rebounding from World War II. I mean, how many of us actually grew up with stories about how our grandmothers made their own clothing and they made their mother's clothing and sometimes they even made our clothing and everyone made our own clothing and that's all we did because God forbid we eat. We're just sewing all the time. Um, it was, I think all of us, right? Right. Um, so uh, slide please, if you will. Oh, oh there we go, marvelous. Um, well, as it turns out, the phenomenon of it being cheaper and easier to make your own clothing is not actually a universal truth for all of history. In fact, in the grand scheme of things, it's a very recent development that actually came on the heels on the invention of the sewing machine and commercial paper patterns from the mid 19th century, which also corresponds with the rise of the middle class during the industrial revolution. Yay, capitalism. Oh, it's becoming stand up. Oh, this is fun. Okay, they should not have let me hold the mic. That's the problem. The moment the mic goes in the hand, I'm like, okay, how are we doing everyone? How's, how's it even going to <laughs> But I have to be an academic and read off my paper. Um, okay, slide please, marvelous. Before all of that though, clothing manufacturing was completed by tradesmen and women who underwent multi-year apprenticeships to learn the art and skills of their craft. There were no how-to books, commercial patterns, or any useful knowledge that was readily available. And honestly, any books that were published very often left out huge chunks of relevant information on purpose. Apprentices learned from their master, master or the mistress of their shops as a part of a loosely structured educational process during the 18th century that would be completed when people came of age between 18 and 21. Usually women would come of age at 18, men at 21, because hormones. Um, I like, I love satirical prints, so this is an apprentice over there. It's barbering, and I know it's not really clothing related, but I thought it was a really good example of just an apprentice being awkward in the back. Um, slide, madam. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, now before I get into the different trades, I do actually do, want, I really want to make a quick note about gender and the use of gendered language in this section here. I will be using heavily gendered language that reflects the gender binary that was historically used in relation to the trades and clothing worn during the 18th century. However, since gender is fluid, I will be endeavoring to use more inclusive language when and where I can in the section. So I just want to give a heads up. Um, Gender is really important, actually, in the discussion of the fashion trades in the 18th century, so it's interesting. Okay, so while there are many clothing and fashion-related trades in the 18th century and early 19th century, the big three are tailoring, millinery, and mantua making. First is the tailoring trade. It was and still is a male-dominated trade that focuses on taking customers' measurements and drafting patterns on either fabric or paper. While the tailoring trade worked mostly with male clients to create their coats, their waistcoats, and their breeches, Slide, please. Mm. Tailors would also make women's writing habits and even stays during the 18th century. Saucy. Because that's a stay maker. Got a good view. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and sometimes this is actually just what they would specialize in. So you would see advertisements for ladies habit makers or ladies stays makers, and, and it would be a male, uh, a male tailor doing it. Um, and, and just to clarify, in case anyone's unaware, stays are the 18th century bone support garment that women would wear to support their back and their chest and to give them the fashionable shape during the 18th century. It's not a corset. Um, this is completely nuanced, but corsets are actually translated to jumps or bodices in 18th century English. And the corset, as we know, it comes a much later. So these are stays. They're a little different. And there's a really lovely reproduction pair on display in the exhibition, if you have not seen them yet. OK. Slide, please, ma'am. OK. Tailors could also expand outside of just making garments and becoming merchant tailors, which means not Oh yeah, okay. I was like, <laughs> which means that not only would they make clothing for their customers, but they would also sell fabrics, notions, and other goods related to the making of masculine garments. Just like today, there's a lot of money to be made in retail, a lot of money, and the selling of ready-made goods in comparison to just selling one's labor, you know, wholesale markup, all of that kind of thing. Slide, please. I'm so sorry, Kelly. <laughs> Women's gowns and petticoats were made by mantua makers, which was the female dominated dressmaking trade. It's actually one of the few female dominated trades in the 18th century, which actually warranted the gendered name difference. So a so one would actually be a journey woman mantua maker instead of a journey man. If there was a man mantua maker, he would actually be designated as a man mantua maker. One could be a mistress of a shop instead of a master. Slide, please. And while women could and would work in all trades, not professions, but trades, they would still be referred to as journeyman blacksmiths or journeyman wheelwrights. This gender distinction in mantua making and the millinery trade is actually indicative of how much it is a female dominated industry. That is a female blacksmith right there in the corner. Um, that's why there's a star there. Because she's the star of the show. Okay, um, slide please. Marvelous. Mantua making is also a relatively new trade in the 18th century. The mantua gown was a style of gown that came into fashion at the end of the 17th century. It was a looser style of gown that was worn over stays that was pleated and pinned to fit over the body. It also is like you can see where like 18th century gowns, like peak 18th century gowns that we're looking at, evolve from this. Like you can see like the robings there in the front and like the pleats in the back. They all come from this baby right here. She's very important. Slide, please. The mantua was a stark difference from the smooth covered stays that were worn over petticoats that dominated the fashion of the 17th century that were traditionally made by tailors. Slide, please. While women have historically always worked with tailors, they were never given the recognition or the distinction in that work. So when the mantua came into fashion, women were basically like able to take that style and be like, hey, you don't actually want to do this, do you, tailor dudes? No, I don't think so. That doesn't seem worth your time or effort. So we're just going to yoink that over here and turn it into a very successful business where we make lots of money and have upward mobility and financial independence as married and unmarried women. Damn. So that's what they did. <laughs> Love the mantua. Slide, please. What also distinguishes a mantua maker from the tailor is how they create clothing. This print has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I just think it's funny. It's chaos. Uh, <laughs> I love 18th century satirical prints, by the way, a lot. Um, so where was I? It's how they created clothing. So where the tailor actually cuts and measures and like drafts patterns and flat patterns, the mantua maker would actually drape fabric over the body of the customer, cut the fabric to the body and fit it on the body. So in modern terminology, this is what we call draping. So this is also where we have that differentiation of clothing construction. So this starts in the end of the 17th century, very early 18th century. So by the 1760s, when the movie Dangerous Liaisons takes place, mantua makers were the dominant force behind the design and creation of feminine clothing. Slide, madam. The third and final big trade of the 18th century fashion world is the millinery trade. Again, it is a female dominated industry that focuses on the manufacturing and selling of fashionable goods and accessories. So for our purposes here in the room today and online, it is the roughly frilly fun bits. So that were worn both actually by men and women. So I'm talking caps, hats, mitts, muffs, gloves, cloaks, places, petticoats, aprons, snack tuckers, elbow ruffles, stockers, cravats for men, knee buckles, shoe buckles, stock buckles, shirt pins, and shirt buttons, elbow ruffles, elbow flances, et cetera, et cetera. They also just sold like fashionable stuff, like cheese. 
they did. I saw an advertisement once and they like listed off everything and then like big all capital. So it was like, geez. I'm like, you all really know how to appeal to like the feminine market, don't you? It's like cheese, booze, and chocolate. Yes, sign me up. We're just, just take my money. <laughs> Anyways, it was common for young women to apprentice to both the mantua making and the millinery trade simultaneously, as clearly they worked really well together. And like merchant tailors, there was a lot of money to be made in the millinery trade, so much so that men, slide please, wanted to get in on the millinery trade because apparently everything else wasn't good enough for them, much to the annoyance and the anger of women. <laughs> There are a lot of satirical prints, as you see here, and plays expressing the frustration towards man milliners of the late 18th century. Uh, Leonard, everyone talks about like Marie Antoinette and like Leonard, like the hairdresser. You all know who I'm talking about, right? Oh, he and Rose Bertin, because Rose Bertin was actually a milliner. Everyone's like, oh, she's a modiste. She's a stylist. I'm like, no, she's a milliner. She's a businesswoman. She's real smart. They were frenemies. Ooh. It's like, Leonard, you need to back off because he just was publishing books talking like smack about other hairdressers. I'm like, to stay in your lane, dude. Anyways, he did it because it makes a lot of money. Moving on, I'm digressing here. Um, slide, please. Fashion was a huge driver for global economies, and it was not uncommon for any average person to be wearing the globe on their body at any point in time, whether it's linen from Ireland or wool from Scotland or cotton from China or India. It doesn't, I mean, like just indigo and dyes, it's just beaver hats in Russia. It's just a huge global economy that we're dealing with in the 18th century. So, lost my place because I was going off myself. Let me see here. So we speak a lot today actually about the perils and frustrations with the fast fashion like garment industry today, right? And the 18th century, actually, it wasn't that much better than us. Um, fashions changed rapidly. And that's how the tailors, milliners, and mantua makers liked it. Because when we have fast moving fashions and ever changing styles, what that meant is that the fashion conscious customer would be in on a regular basis to have their clothing kept up to date. Slide, please. Because God forbid your gown is trimmed in the 1759 style one, girl. It is 1762. What is wrong with you? Ugh. Cannot. So since labor was cheap in comparison to fabric and gowns, it was also relatively inexpensive to have your clothing updated to the latest designs. Because paying someone to unpick all of those hand stitches and restitch a gown in the latest fashion, it was a lot cheaper than actually going out and buying new fabric and then having a whole new gown made from that. Slide, please. So what this means is that the vast, 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 vast majority of gowns that survive in museum collections today are remade from an older and different style at least once. So this is actually, um, this is a recent acquisition by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. It is a Piedmontese from 1780, which is very special. We're pretty sure that this is like the only Piedmontese gown in North America. There's like one in Chile and a couple in France. It's a big, it's really cool. Um, but it was clearly remade from some, we think it was remade from a sack from probably around 1770s, um, just based off the fabric. So you can just see some really amazing piecing here in the sleeve. Um, also side note, this thing has like over a 30 inch waist. So they were not all smaller back then. It's very relatable size. <laughs> like, oh, it's me. <laughs> I'll just take that, Neil, don't mind me. Uh, so um, slide, please. So it's actually one of the reasons why this original gown from the 1750s and 60s um, in the Colonial Williamsburg's collection is actually pretty special. The evidence seems to indicate that it was actually only remade once from a 1750s style to a 1760s style. So very subtle updates. So yeah, somehow it escaped the great destruction of early 1700s gowns into 1840s party dresses. Slide, please. Yes, this was a thing. This is technically 1820s, but it illustrates my point. Um, a lot of 1840s gowns were actually made from picked apart 18th century gowns. Slide, please. So it, it's in this section that if this was a video, I would have Sarah McLaughlin playing like, I will remember you. And like a very like sad montage. Da, 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 da. So this one's 18th century fabric, slide please. This one's also 18th century fabric, so it's very sad. Thanks ladies for making it into 1840s dresses. Anyways, okay, so now we have a basic understanding of how the fashion trades of the 18th century worked, who made people's clothing, etc. So now it's time to start actually diving into dangerous liaisons and 
James Atchison's designs. Slide, please. So Dangerous Liaisons was actually first published in 1782. This is right after the end of the American Revolution, which ended in 18, 1781, and a few years before the storming of the Bastille and the beginning of the French Revolution, because that was a good time. Historically speaking, the last quarter of the 18th century is a time of incredible upheaval and changes both in government, society, and culture, both for good and for bad. Um, we have huge growth in science, art, and philosophy, but we're also seeing the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, which brings about poor working conditions, negative environmental impact, extreme colonialism, and long-standing repercussions that we are still dealing with today. And also, we cannot forget the brutal and horrific practices of enslavement of Africans that began in the early 17th century, as well as the genocide of indigenous peoples in North and South America. Oh, it's a rough time. Anyways, slide, please. And Dangerous Liaisons is a French novel that is essentially eviscerating the French aristocracy as narcissistic, cruel, vain, and amoral. That helps set the tone for what the 1780s were like. Also, I don't, I don't know how many like general history people are in here, but it's like the French allied with us and the French were a monarchy and they allied with us to fight for our independence against another monarchy. Like, I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. It's just like, you're just like, hey, French citizens, we're gonna show you, oops, didn't think that went through. Was, like did not see the big picture on that one. Anyways, uh, slide please. So fashion for the 1780s was also transitional. Hoops and the robe à la française gown are what we call in English sacks. Um, in, so yeah, in English, we call them sacks. It's not nearly as sexy, but it's a lot easier to spell. Of the 1760s and 70s, it gave way to the false rump and closely fitted gowns of the 1780s. Stays were low and thrusty. Hair became very wide and frizzy, appropriating African hair texture. So we can see the difference here between the two. Um, the, let's see, slide please. The early 1780s was also when fashion for the chemise gown came into style for the fashionable set, emulating a much more relaxed and summery understated look. Also, there's a lot of debate about the appropriation of that gown style um, from enslaved communities in the Caribbean. Slide, please. By the mid-1790s, the chemise gowns and classical Greco-Roman influences pushed women's fashion towards high-waisted gowns with the bust sitting in a low natural position with a much more natural shape and the structured appearance of women's bodies and clothing was gone. So the 1780s is basically the final decade when we pushed through all of that. Waistlines are going up, boobs are going this way. It's no longer like, pff, it's just very different. Slide, please. However, for the film adaptation, James Atchison wanted to set the costumes firmly in the 1760s with lots of ruffles, lace, and trims, and wide hoops. Slide, please. I'm so sorry, Kelly. If we look at, if we, so if we actually look at these two portraits, one from the 1760s and one from the 1780s, the difference in fashion is extremely obvious, isn't it? Like, it's like, oh, oh yeah. Um, so just so we're clear, the Catherines of the 1780s would not be caught dead in the 1760s, like they would rather die. And many of them did. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> too soon. <laughs> but so I just wanna kind of point out, like we, I mentioned the hair. Um, so we see like the very full rounded hair that has been frizzed using a technique called creping, which does emulate African hair texture. Um, you also see slightly looser curls being worn, but hers looks like it's actually been, it's been creped. Um, hair powder is being worn also in the 1780s, where for English women it's not, but I'll talk, talk about that in a second a little bit more. But notice how like fitted the sleeves are, how tight they are, and like they're, they're nice and long, they're very fitted and structured. Here we're just like ruffles vomited everywhere. It's just like someone was just like pin the ruffle on the princess. Um, but much more simplistic in its design. We do see some ruffles and things like that in 1780s, but it's just a much cleaner line. I really like the 1780s for style, just by the way. So, so okay, slide please. As I was saying, while I am admittedly, but very biased towards the 1780s, I do find clothing this time to actually be aesthetically very pleasing. Atchison's reasoning behind putting the film in the 1760s is actually very sound, quote, if we'd said it later, it would have been very big wigs and hats and layered billowing bodices. We wanted to make it simpler, stronger, less elaborate. 
We experimented with a more powdered made up look, but it's difficult when the whole film is shot so close up. So the artificiality of Glenn Close is left until the end and used as a very dramatic statement. Okay, so I'm gonna have to agree to disagree with Atchison on some of his 1780s hot takes. Cause I, I don't agree like that with all of that. Um, but I actually totally understand why he was setting, he wanted to set dangerous liaisons in the 1760s. It makes a lot of sense. Slide please. So the 1760s sits as like this really interesting point in the century where the gowns and the silhouettes are iconic, while also people's appearances are a little bit more accessible for 21st century folks. So the tall and wide hairstyles of the 1770s and 80s could actually be kind of jarring for modern audiences, especially if they're done like correctly with hair powder and just the shapes of them. Um, so it kind of could risk taking the audience like out of that moment of watching the film because you're kind of going, whoa what's going on. And if you don't get the portions completely like dead on accurate, it looks even worse. Like proportion is really important with 1770s and 1780s hair. So the thing is when you have the film set in the 1760s, the hair is actually pretty low and relatively simple. Um, and a slide please, yes. And yes, while most European countries actually wore heavily powdered hair in the 1760s, England actually went mostly unpowdered. Um, and so Atchison having the women with unpowdered hair, even though they're technically supposed to be French, is still completely within the realm of period accuracy and believability. Um, English women actually really didn't start powdering their hair until the 1770s. And you actually see that in hairdressing manuals where like they're writing and they're like, okay, start powdering your hair, ladies. That's what the French girls are doing. Do it. And the English women are like, okay. And then like they dump their head in the powder and it's like, oh, okay, it's a little aggressive. Let's, let's bring that back. <laughs> Sorry, I can like go on about hair powder. I love it. Anyways, um, so furthermore, the sack gown of the 1760s and its wide hoops and the full box pleats falling gracefully from the shoulders encapsulates the visual impact of the 18th century for most people. It's this iconic silhouette of the century, one that most people can recognize and identify. So even if you're not knowledgeable in 18th century fashion dress, if you see a, a woman with the big box pleats and the big hoops, she's walking around like this, you're going to be like, ah, Marie Antoinette. And you're like, yeah, you got it. So for the for a general audience, it works really, really well. So uh, slide, please. <laughs> so in a 1989 interview about his work, Atchison describes the process he and his crew went through to create the looks for dangerous liaisons, which had a lot of challenges with material sourcing time and research. Just like today, Atchison struggled to find period correct 18th century prints and weaves and cotton and silk. And while this is still an issue today, I personally found it amusing <laughs> that Atchison struggled because if you like talk to people today who like are into the historical like clothing reconstruction, like they lament about like the quote unquote good old days, like the 1980s and 90s, where like you could still find silk damask curtains and Dutch printed cotton chintzes and hand woven linen with the good salvage from Eastern Europe. I'm not even kidding. I've, I've been a part of these conversations and I was like, I was five. Sorry, slide, please. <laughs> when we look at the gowns in the movie and on display, we can see that Atchison did utilize actually a lot of solid color and plain woven silks. We see that also in the display downstairs with like very choice uses for like the damask and the prints. However, I also just want to make a quick note that uh, strawberry printed scalamandre fabric um, that Uma Thurman's wearing was also used in 2006's Marie Antoinette and it's still available today. Just side note. It's like everyone that's like, oh, the strawberry fabric. Um, so, and this is just actually an aside, but um, when I was reading this interview, I, I really appreciated the nuance of, of James Atchison's nerdiness <laughs> um, because they wrote, quote, though he worries that the connoisseurs of the audience might notice, Atchison used lace from the Victorian and Edwardian eras rather than lace from the 18th century. With the underskirts and figure enhancing structuring of the women's dresses, there weren't a lot of other shortcuts he could take. I'm like, dude, really? <laughs> like, I'd be like, cool, it's lace. I don't know. <laughs> like, I think I know like three people who'd be like, oh my God, is that Victorian lace? <gasps> I'm so offended. That's not historically accurate. Fail. <laughs> this is awful. One star on IMDb. <laughs> Slide, please. 
Addison also made sure that every woman in the cast had proper support garments and that there were multiple pairs of stays made for each actress. While there is a blue silk pair on display in the exhibition, I do also have it on very good authority that some pairs went home with the original makers as a sort of memento for working on the production. Don't tell me how I know that. Like, well, I won't tell you how I know that, but I do. Because I was asking this person and she was like, those are not the ones. I did not like those in the exhibition. I'm like, how do you know? She was like, because I have them. <laughs> Don't tell Glenn. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> um, also, it's a common trope, and it's frankly the bane of many dress historians and YouTubers' existence, that the idea of corsetry was uncomfortable and harmful to the wearer. This confusion and idea, unfortunately, is often perpetuated by actresses promoting the latest period film with hot sound bites about how uncomfortable the corsets are. However, Atchison, being the gem that he is, did not allow for that conversation to happen. Quote, I worked with women between the ages of 18 and 83. Even Mildred Natwick was corseted. The thing about all that structuring is if it's done properly, your body can relax into them. Your body learns to cope with the structure which governs the way you walk, sit, and move. Oh, that was real sexy. I was like, that's the best quote of all time. I love it. So the crew also had a very short turnaround time for this film. They actually only had three and a half weeks to research the costumes, which included actually studying original garments and to use for the design and construction basis. Slide, please. Okay, so this is actually something that I found particularly interesting because this explains so much when it comes to the success of the costuming of this film. What sets this piece apart from so many is the attention to detail that helps the gowns and suits sit correctly on the body and they fit in such so perfectly and they move with the set design like it just, oh! It's so good, so good. Slide, please. So with that in mind, I asked Kelly Richardson, the curator of the Sage Collection here at IU, to send me what images she could of the interiors of the Glen Close gowns and from Dangerous Liaisons so that I could compare what we see and understand from the costume construction techniques to an original gown from the 1760s where the, for when, when the movie was set. So, uh, slide, please. I will also be using one gown from the Colonial Williamsburg collection that I studied last week while I was there as the original sample to base our comparison off of for this lecture. It's this cream silk damask sack gown with its matching petticoat. It has, like I said, been altered once um, from a slightly earlier style, but it fits perfectly within the design timeframe of when the movie is set. Now, so before we start like this comparison, I do also want to point out that there are some relatively standard practices with 18th century gown construction. However, no gown is identical in construction. They're all different. And there's always variations. The only hard and fast rule is that the gowns are hands are hand sewn. That's it. Everything else is guidelines. So I'm just choosing to use one gown also as a comparison sample for the sake of ease and lack of confusion. Because as much as it would be fun for us to like sit here and throw up like tons of gown interiors, that also can get really confusing. So we're just going to use the one as a sample. Slide, please. As for the Dangerous Liaisons gown, we're going to be looking again at the blue sack that's currently on display. Um, again, it's copied from the Boucher portrait. And, I, and I might, I'm using one, a couple of other interior shots that just kind of better show Atchison's like team's construction. But for the most part, we're looking at this gown. Uh, slide, please. So you can see, oh, da, 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 da. what slide are we on? What number is this? Have we lost, sorry, lost thought? I don't know. There's that one. Oh, we'll, we'll stay here. Uh, I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm just getting ahead of myself. Um, okay. But mostly we're just, yeah, looking at the sack. So first things first, both gowns are actually stomacher front sack back gowns that were the height of fashion for the mid 18th century. Um, to make a gown a sack back, oh, we are on the right slide. Okay. To make a gown a sack back, it must possess the two wide box pleats that fall from the shoulders of the wearer down to the hem. The width of the box pleats actually varies according to the decade, uh, but a safe rule of thumb is that the wider the box pleat, the earlier in the century it's, it is. So for both gowns, as you can see, they have very wide box pleats that span shoulder to shoulder. You can also see, slide please, in original portraits as well as in the film stills that these gowns fit very snugly around the body and that the tension helps kick out the box pleats so they flow elegantly away from the body. A common dressmaking trick for this is to actually have a third hidden pleat um, underneath the two visible box pleats. Slide please. In the CW gown, uh, we have that pleat, and for the and for actually a lot of Atchison's gowns, it's visible too. And however, like I could have sworn the blue gown had a third pleat. I could have sworn like I would have bet money on it. And then I went back and I was like, "What? 
where is it? So I guess it doesn't, or maybe it's just really well hidden, but I could not see it. Um, but it's actually fine because it sits the way it's supposed to, so that, that's really all that matters. Slide, please. So the front of both gowns are secured by a stomacher, which is the triangular and usually highly decorated piece that is at the center front of the garment. The original to the Colonial Williamsburg gown, it no longer exists, so it's actually just displayed with a reproduction stomacher, but the blue gown also is just a really lovely example of very decorated stomachers and how they would have looked. Slide, please. From what I can tell from the images Kelly sent me, the blue gown either laces up or hooks an eye shut at the center front. Is that correct? On the side. Ooh, sneaky. More Victorian dressmaking techniques. Dude. Oh, you'll find out. It's like the unspoken like part of this lecture is it's all Victorian dressmaking techniques. So this is really cool. <laughs> so, but it, it hooks somewhere in the front and then the stomach is secured over top of the gown. And it's using hooks and eyes, as you can see there, um, to secure it. And we get the right tension, we get the right fit. So that's actually, um, let me see, where am I? Yeah. Um, so that's actually really common. It's a common kind of method behind it. The only difference is, is that 18th century hooks and eyes weren't that commonly used. Straight pins were used. So slide, please. Mm -hmm. Details. Um, and also a needle wound in my thumb from a sewing project. Sorry about that. Graphic. I didn't realize how big that was going to be. So I also love, though, that this is the original gown. And so these discoloration, those marks, those are actually pin marks from where the stomacher would have been pinned to the bodice. Slide, please. So the other thing that this gown has in common with the CW gown is how all the trim, trim is pinked. And while 18th century pinking tools, which effectively they looked like chisels, would have been used, it seems like the dangerous liaisons crew uh, successfully just used normal pinking shears to create that effect. Um, I was actually talking to Neil Hurst, who's the associate curator of costume and textiles at Colonial Williamsburg, and he was telling me that the vast majority of the gowns in their collection, uh, especially the silk gowns, are all pinked. Like whether the, the front of the skirts are pinked, all the trim is pinked. So it was very, very common, which makes sense because it's a lot faster way to finish the edge and it looks really pretty than like hemming all of that. Trust me, I've done it. It's not fun. Zero out of 10, don't recommend. Slide please. So even the trimming layouts are very similar um, between the two uh, from the serpentine pattern on the side of the skirts to like the rows of the ruffle, the petticoats, how the stomacher is done and the robings, all of that. Um, slide, please. Whoops. Uh, just a little side note. Um, this is really fun. The uh, sleeves in the original gown still have their lead weight. Makes the sleeves weigh a ton. It's, it was chunky. It's chunky. Don't eat it. Like, <laughs> this is like lead. But it helps, you know, it really helps with hold the sleeves and the ruffles in the right location on the arm and on the body. So I just think it's cool. Um, both gowns also do support the have like the nice elaborate sleeves as well. Slide please. So the final notable similarity that I wanted to point out are actually how the petticoats are constructed. Both are center back closing petticoats that are pleated to fit the waist. In the original 18th century gown, the waist of the petticoat is heavily pieced and a cheaper silk is used to help take up space in the back of the petticoat. Um, both of these things are actually common fabric saving practices, ergo money saving practices uh, that were used in the 18th century because fabric like this silk damask could be very expensive. <laughs> And customers would have wanted to use as little fabric as possible to save as much money as possible. So piecing in places that's less visible and using cheaper fabrics where it wouldn't be visible are both commonly and heavily utilized tricks. So you can kind of see like just the stitching. It's just, it's insane. There's a lot of piecing in the waist. And then this is like a super cheap, cheap, lightweight silk, like probably like what we call like a half tie silk. And it's like two layers of it, not the same weight at all with the damask. It's, I don't know. I was like, okay, I would be scared that it'd fall apart, but obviously it didn't. So, um, no, we're good. Okay. Um, yeah, this is it. Yeah, this is, yeah. So, so obviously they didn't really need to utilize those cost saving tricks for the, for the costume. That's not a big deal. Um, but I do want to point out that both of the petticoats are back closing. So it's a pretty common accepted idea that 18th century petticoats were split on the sides and then you tie them back to front and then you bring the front up over the top and you tie that to the back, but not always the case. So just center back closing and then they had the pocket slits just like cut either where a skirt seam is or just cut with scissors, something like that. Okay, slide please. So now it's time to talk differences. 
Um, first is the most obvious difference. They used a sewing machine. Shocking. <laughs> Obviously, we would never actually expect a movie or a TV show or anyone like in this sort of situation to hand sew any of the costumes worn in the production because that would be insane and ridiculous. <laughs> um, and also, which is how tight these turnaround times are, it would also probably kill the technicians who are building these garments. Like, it would be awful. <laughs> so, and just from my own previous experience working in the business that supplies shoes to like film TV and all of that, they always needed it yesterday. Like, that's the timeline. It's not tomorrow. It's like, no, I actually needed this yesterday. It's like, oh no. So um, it's very intense. Slide, please. And uh, so in the 18th century though, all the clothing was hand sewn um, because there was no sewing machine. They didn't even want a sewing machine. And every time there was even a discussion about the sewing machines, people would basically riot. I'm not kidding. And uh, actually in the 1830s, uh, there was like, an, someone had come up with a sewing machine, like a prototype. And it's like, mid 1830s in France and a bunch of French tailors being French rioted, burnt the warehouse down. Pretty sure some people died. It's very intense. Um, but I mean, it makes sense because the sewing machine was actually a direct threat onto those people's livelihoods. Because if you have a sewing machine, why do you need a tailor? Like the, the sewing, the construction, the seamstressing work. Yeah. So it's, it was not a, not a thing people were into. So, however, the appearance of stitches aren't the only things that are affected when people sew 18th century gowns with a machine instead of by hand. In fact, the order of construction and operation changes too, and we can see that in the photos of the costumes. Slide, please. I'm rambling a lot more than normal. Okay, so the construction techniques in the costumes are indicative of modern theatrical build techniques, and interestingly, as I noted earlier, are much more similar to Victorian and Edwardian dressmaking techniques than 18th century. So we see large pink seam allowances at the side seams and boning used at the seams to help keep the bodice looking smooth and fitted to the torso. This is like peak Edwardian dressmaking techniques. Like, if you had just been like, send me like a photo of like that section, I'd be like, oh, is that an Edwardian gown? I'm like, no, it's dangerous liaisons. I'm like, whoa. So just by the way. Um, so slide, please. Then the 18th century gown, what we see are the side seam allowances are constructed using a whip seam treatment. So this is where the mantua maker would actually fit the lining of the bodice on the customer. She would pin it from the outside, just kind of do like a pinch here. And then what you do is you take it off, you leave the pins in place, and then you whip it closed. And you press that raw edge open, and then you lay the silk over top. You top stitch that down from the outside so it looks like really pretty because you have this beautiful space back stitch. It's really aesthetic. And then all the raw edges are hidden. It's just beautiful. So that's what we're seeing here is this whipped construction technique. And then here's the top stitching right there. Um, okay, so the other thing is, slide please is that this gown doesn't have any boning in the bodice. And this is actually relatively common for the 18th century. However, there are gowns that do have boning in bodices. So it was done. It's just, usually they're actually kind of like integral to the bodice itself and not just applied in boning casings over top of anything, which again, is a very Victorian, especially late Victorian and Edwardian dressmaking technique. Slide, please. Another Victorian dressmaking technique that we're seeing in dangerous liaisons costumes that were not a thing in the 18th century is the use of piping on the bodices. And it's super subtle on screen, but when you see it in person, the piping is actually pretty obvious. So uh, like I said, it was not a thing. The 18th century did not do piping. They were much more casual about how they finished edges and they, they just were not bothered at all and no one cared. Slide please. So you know, overall, when we break down the comparison of the two garments, I do actually find it fascinating how the technicians utilized different sewing techniques to suit their timeline and their needs, while still creating beautiful gowns that read as just amazing, period correct, on screen. And so the costumes in Dangerous Liaisons are held up as the standard to which all other 18th century period dramas are compared to, and it's really easy to see why. James Atchison's careful attention to detail, silhouette, and materials helped create a visually stunning world to which the vicious scheming of narcissistic French aristocrats plays out. And slide, please. Ah. <laughs> And now we've reached the conclusion of this lecture. Um, I do hope that you guys have enjoyed going on this <laughs> journey with me. I'm so sorry.
<laughs> but, so before we start the question and answer section, I do uh, want to point out very quickly that I've actually brought some of my uh, reconstructions out uh, with me. They were just, I had another thing in Williamsburg the week before I was here. I was just like, well, <laughs> I guess I'll bring these with me up to Bloomington. Um, so they're out um, in the front. When we're done here, you all are welcome to go have a look at them and see how they were constructed. I made them using uh, techniques and methods that I've seen in original gowns. They are not identical to the ones we just looked at. So you're welcome to explore and have a look. I am not, I'm not possessive over them. I do not care. You can touch them. The sack has been in New York City on a fire escape. It's filthy. I don't care. Just don't steal them. That's all I ask. That, that, that's really all I care about. Um, and yeah, they're all hand sewn. And yeah, and that's that. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. Um, so we can take questions from the audience. And um, I'm going to go over here. So what I'll do is I'll listen to your questions and I'm going to repeat it into the microphone. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to repeat this? <laughs> so, uh, wanting to know if you bought a reproduction of the, and I didn't catch the word, did you? Mima. And then um, had a question about the mullet. Yes. Uh, Mima, no. No, I don't have Mima with me. She's being sassy in an archival box with other ones, telling them how to behave because kids these days. Um, so, no, I don't have her with me. Um, and mullets, yes. Yes. That was all mullets. Um, so yeah, 1780s mullets, 1790s mullets. I found some really good mullets like when I was looking up images for this. I mean, it was just like, poof, and it wasn't even curled. So it was just like powdered bang, powdered this, 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 this. And I was like, you might have wanted to curl that, honey. It doesn't look as good as you think it does. <laughs> so, but yeah, they had the mullets. But Glenn Close did not have a mullet. They didn't do, I don't, well, they might have done mullets. I, yeah, they definitely did do mullets in the 1750s and 60s too. It just sort of depends, but I don't think Glenn Close rocked a mullet for this one. I didn't see any mullet looking hair. Nothing frizzy there on top. Other questions? Sure. Uh, the question is, do you think that the strawberry gown from Dangerous Laisons is the dress that was remade for Marie Antoinette? I have no idea. I don't know. I'm sure someone on the internet does know. Yes. Yes. I don't know this one specifically. Yeah, the question is, do you think that the colonial Williamsburg dress was not remade because of the fabric saving and the piecing in the back of the skirt? No, I don't think that had anything to do with it. I think it just got lucky. I think whoever, whatever trunk that ended up in, no one found it in the 1840s. No, nah, because that would have all been picked apart um, and then reused. And with the how big the fabric is in the, in the back of the sack, and how much fabric is in there. Oh no, that thing would have been butchered. It would have been butchered. Um, so no, it just got lucky. It just, just wasn't found and destroyed. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> So the question one is about uh, protecting the gowns from perspiration. Uh, what was done? Okay, uh, so this is a multi-part. So for 18th century, I have not seen any evidence of anything kind of stitched or pinned into place to protect from sweating. Um, obviously a woman's shift, which would have been made out of linen, which would have wicked away all of our perspiration and grossness would have absorbed the sweat. And then the gowns are usually lined in linen too. It's usually actually pretty sturdy linen, so it could also help wick away. But I have seen some nasty pit stains. And they were like, oh, the silk is bleeding. How unfortunate. I'm just like, oh my gosh, like Meemaw? 
Ooh, she's got some nasty pit stains. That's 1870s, but, um, and then, but in later on, like with my originals, especially the really, really nice originals that I have, like, so things that were like designer made from the late Victorian and early Edwardian eras, um, you do actually see shield guards put in. And that's, to me, I consider that almost, I mean, obviously you could buy them, like they're in ladies magazines all the time, but when I see them, they're always in the really, really, really nice gowns. Um, and sometimes they're like rubberized and it, it's decomposing and you're like, oh God, what is this? I thought it was blood once and it wasn't, but I thought it was, and it was very scary, but no, with the 18th century, I don't, I don't see it. You just kind of see pit stains and, and just kind of allows that to go. That's to say that they didn't, it's completely within the realm of possibility. I've just never seen it before. So, I mean, it's, it's not a bad idea. Just take a little bit of like linen or even a little bit of like wool flannel and just kind of like stitch it in right there. It's like, it would really help. Um, but yeah, I just see a lot of pit stains. Another question? How long have you been studying uh, dark history and what kind of lessons have you started and what have not? Okay, the question is how long has Abby been studying dress history and what got her started along this path? So I, um, I'm, I'm 35 now, I'm old. Uh, so I've been aggressively studying this um, for basically 15 years now. Um, so when I was an undergrad here, uh, my professor in costume design, Linda Pisano, hi, <laughs> um, she, she was doing, she was teaching and, and I just, I was telling the story actually the other day and she was talking about costume design and we were like looking at historic stuff and I remember she had like these sh like images of just like silhouettes of different periods and I was able to sit there and be like oh that's Henry the eighth oh that's Marie Antoinette oh that's Victorian oh that's this time oh this was awesome oh my god I loved it and so I was like Linda I would like to know what they actually wore back then and how it was made she was like what <laughs> costume design <laughs> and I was like extreme nerdiness. <laughs> so she actually got me started. Um, she's here today. I'm trying not to like get super sentimental and embarrass her, but she's here today and it's, I, I'm having a moment. Like, um, so I kind of <laughs> became like a very obsessed Aussie. It was just like, this is why I have Subasa. She's, she's the most like me. Anyone who watches the channel knows my hell beast Subasa. Um, but yeah, I just like laser focus, just like, poof. Like, oh my God, I can't, I eat, sleep and breathe it. I, I swear to God, I am, my husband's like, I hate this. <laughs> and I'm like, he's like sports. I'm like, okay, but look at this bodice I just got. And like Nicole and Chrissy come over. We're like, oh my God. And he's like, I just want to play Overwatch. <laughs> um, so no, I've been obsessed with it from studying it. And like I said, I have my master's in it. Um, and yeah, for free time, I still research really obscure stuff and dress history for, for funsies. <laughs> and then I turn it into a video. <laughs> so I've been doing it for a while. Other questions? Yes. Question is about how the sleeves for the dangerous liaisons costumes were set in. Were they 1760s set in or maybe a 19th century? Question for you. Style. Were these machine stitched all the way around? Yeah. Then yes, yes Victorian yes. style. I could I couldn't see. Um, I, I wasn't able to like get up on the platform and be like, excuse me, madam. <laughs> Let me just so, but yeah, I mean, most sleeve construction I've seen, 18th century sleeve construction is very weird. Um, it's a very uh, weird way to put the put the sleeve on where you like you back stitch underneath and then you kind of slide it up and then you put the strap over top of it. You know, you don't see that after the early 1800s. So I wouldn't really expect a lot of people to maintain that because honestly, yeah, if you're in a machine, you just go in a circle. It just makes a lot more sense. Though I will say, I will say, I just said that. However, that Piedmontese, it was back stitched all the way around and I was like, oh, Neil, that's different. And he was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, that's not how they normally do it, Neil. So, I mean, 1780s, it was hand-stitched, basically back-stitched all the way around, um, not in the normal, normal construction method, so. Another question? Yes?
question is, where do you find reproduction fabrics? Where do you shop, Abby? Um, so it, de it depends on what I'm doing. Um, 18, like if you want just good, like good quality wools and linens for inexpensive prices, Burnley and Trowbridge has always been a favorite of mine. Um, and I can t guarantee that the research that Angela does is, is incredible when it comes to sourcing and like period correct. She also does some really good um, printed cotton reproductions too that are based off of originals that she's studied as well. So Burnley and Trowbridge is one. Renaissance Fabrics has gorgeous silks. And they're really expanding their their selection of different types of weaves and materials, especially for like Renaissance stuff. Like they have some really nice damasks. Um, for like my latest reconstruction project, project um, the 1904 satin net gown, that I I sourced all over the place from B and J Fabric, Mood, my local mill end, um, silks taffeta that I had in my stash. The silk satin is from New York designer fabrics. Um, so it was just all over the place. Um, so, but it, for like, especially if we're keeping it within the realm of 18th century, Burnley and Trowbridge is always a good baseline to start. They'll have a lot of stuff. For silks, th if they don't have silks, then I would say Renaissance fabrics, especially if you can't get to the garment districts either in LA or New York. You're welcome. Question? All right, will there be a costume college this year? Abby, are you going? And if you're going, are you streaming it? Um, I don't know. I mean, they'll have something because they've always had something, but I am not planning on going to costume college next year. Um, mostly because, well, I have, <laughs> I'm like looking at my schedule going, I don't know when I'm gonna be home next year. <laughs> no, I will be home next year. Uh, we're, well, not in Reno, we're moving, but. Um, but no, I'm not planning on going, but I'm going to be on the uh, Dandy Wellington's cruise, uh, or I'm sorry, the voyage, I think is what I'm technically supposed to call it, from London to New York. So like that, that's in October. There's a, potentially another collaboration thing going on, I think, in July as well um, in Europe, barring, you know, so long as things work out. So I got some other things in the works. So no costume college for me next year. At least it's not. I mean, I might go because I'll get FOMO. I'm like, I want to go sit with everyone in the lobby. And they'd be like, why am I, this food is awful. <laughs> so, but right now, no, I don't have any plans. I think there's another question over here. Yes. My style for Cabo Backpack is theater. And I know that sometimes in theater, when you have in a historical costume, things are maybe altered for ease of movement. Yes. Anything about the dangerous liaisons costumes that were modernized for ease of movement? I'm going to throw that back to you, Kelly. Um, we don't have a lot of 18th century pieces, yeah. so I don't think I would know the yeah. the difference really. Yeah. Um, but I mean, they're just wide skirts. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. think it's difficult to move. I mean, it's a lot of fabric to deal with, mm -hmm. but um, no. I don't think I would say no. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with you. I just was like, maybe you you saw something. But reading Atchison's interviews and also, again, getting like a behind the scenes, like I know someone who like, so I'm not going to like give away like my connections, but like, I don't think he would have done that because he was very particular about how people moved and wanting them to move correctly and was not pleased when he thought people weren't moving correctly in the film and maybe throwing themselves over sofas in a way that he didn't think would be correct. So I have a feeling it was probably like, nope, you're locked and loaded, deal with it. This is how they would have moved. So that's, it's, yeah, you're welcome. Good question. No, I don't think there's way. Dangerous liaisons, no, they, and I was, didn't know that they sometimes did. So that was a great thing that I learned tonight. So yeah, there's no waiting in the sleeves in the Dangerous Liaisons yeah. costume. Just for the web, the web streaming, someone asked if the costume had 
weights. I don't know where the camera is for the web stream. I'm so sorry. I'm just staring off into the abyss now. Um, if the if the sleeves of the costumes and dangerous liaisons had lead weights in them like the original did, and the answer is no. So can I ask where the where are they placed the weights? Um, it, they're kind of um, they're placed like here. Okay. I've also seen some in the flounces themselves, or like evidence of where they would have been. But yeah, they're just kind of hanging there. And there's also buckram um around the top part and looked like they help support the ruffles because those were really tightly gathered and that's that uh silk damask was actually pretty stout it was beefy like it was much heavier and crispier than i would have anticipated it being like i thought it would have been thinner and like a little bit softer but so they actually had some reinforcements around the top around the sleeve too where those ruffles were to help hold it in place okay um we are at six o'clock are you okay with answering a few more questions or this is this is your show if there are some okay yeah. There's questions. Does anyone else have any other questions? Sure. Um, how can you tell the difference between uh, where a seam was pieced together and where a seam was altered? Mm. Difference between a pieced seam and an altered seam. Um. So sometimes they're the same. Um. Usually you can when you see something that's been remade, there's going to be scarring from the stitching. Or if it's like a pleat or a dart and it's been unpicked, you'll see scarring from just it being creased in that way for a long period of time. Um, so that's kind of what we look at for that. Piecing, it could be it could be remade, it could be not. It just sort of depends. So I I don't really take piecing as hard evidence of remake. Usually we're looking for scarring and and shadows of other gowns to confirm. Um, Carolyn Duddell, who uh, she's the modern mantua maker, like on Instagram and, and uh, WordPress, she has her PhD and she studied 18th century gowns. And she was like, I think all but like one she studied, and she studied like almost a thousand at this point, have all been remade. So it's just a safe bet. Um, and even like in the Victorian era, if they kept everything intact, they would almost always take like darts in for like the Victorian corsets because the waist and the curves are different. And so you can, you can see those. Um, you also look for differences in thread, the color, the weight. Um, Victorian thread is a little bit different than 18th century thread, how it's, how it's spun, how it looks, the weight of it. So if there's like weird, thin, odd colored thread used that doesn't match other thread that we know is definitely of the period, then we're kind of like, hey, you don't belong here. <laughs> You're weird. <laughs> um, so very like nuancey things like that. Um, but piecing, nah, piecing could be like completely like original to the, how the gown was constructed. It could be a sign of remaking. It just so it's just cool, and it looks like a lot of work to me. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Historical customers love dogs. Have you, in your research, ever found evidence of um, dog dogs dressed up in costumes? Yes. <laughs> um, you can kind of see it in prints, but there's actually it's not a dog; it's a cat. But I like obviously like it's fifty fifty cat world, right? Um, there's a great story actually of a tailor's apprentice in the eighteenth century who it was Christmas time. And the master and the mistress of the shop were like, deuces, we're going to go make Mary, aka get drunk. Party down, Christmas time. Um, and they left the apprentice alone in the shop with really nothing to do. So what does a teenage boy do when he's bored? <laughs> he made a coat for a cat. <laughs> so he apparently made this coat for the shop cat, put it on the cat, and the cat did what cats do, which is like, ah! And then like the cat went and hid, he couldn't get the coat off the cat. And then the master and the mistress come home, they're drunk. And, and then the cat comes out going, look what this apprentice did to me. <laughs> and they're like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> and then they hung the coat up in the shop window. And the, uh, the memoir where this tailor is talking about it, he, I guess he actually told the, his, his, his master, he was like, I would have just preferred you whipped me instead of hanging it off. 
he was so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, this is the best thing ever. So absolutely they did 100%. And some really nice dog beds, really nice dog beds. So yeah, no, they did for sure. Yes, way in the back. Possibility. I'd love to learn how to sew, but my legs can't do the pedaling thing. And so I don't know if you have any ideas or I know that was a lot. <laughs> and I actually think you can handle Instagram versus pandemic. Thank you. That's oh my gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> I can I can answer your question actually. Um, um uh, in multiple ways, but I'll let Kelly repeat it so the webinar can hear. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> so I bet the question is about um, making costumes for somebody in a wheelchair for 18th century gowns, what to do, how to adapt, um, where should she start? Yeah, so what's, so he, this is something that the past did really, really well when it comes to clothing. Uh, I mean, like we can, the past really did some stuff way wrong, um, but clothing, they did really, really well. Um, and the thing is, is something to keep in mind just as a general rule is that clothing was always custom made for the wearer, especially during the 18th century. And so if you had any particular needs or wants when it comes to movement in your clothing, comfort in your clothing, those could be accommodated easily because that is the job of the tailor or the mantua maker. Like if they can't do that, they suck at their job. Like they're just bad at it. You know, so if you were someone who needed to be in a chair, and you're like, but I, I still want to look good. You're like, absolutely, you're going to look good. So you would just adjust the, the cutting and the fitting to accommodate your body's needs and your wants. I also find that 18th century clothing is a lot more flexible when it comes to female body because female bodies fluctuate every 28 days. <laughs> Whoosh. Whoosh. And also just dealing with, you know, like whether you're postpartum, pregnant, not, you know, what have you, hormones turning 30, um, that we see a lot of adjustability in clothing. So whether things are stomach or front, which allows for a lot of adjustability, lacing up the center front, having the stomach over top, also those gowns lacing up the back or tying in the back to, again, allow for mobility. Um, center front closing gowns, those, again, pin or they can lace. Again, a lot of adjustability there. When it comes to sleeves, that's just moving. I really hope I have not sweated through this dress is polyester. I apologize. But, you know, having that thing. So if you were someone who just remained seated, like for me, what I would do is just make sure when you're comfortable and that nothing is sitting awkwardly on you and that you're not like pinched in any way. And then just make sure that when you're sitting, the gown looks good. Because if, if you're going to be spending most of your time seated, that's what matters, right? So we'll just make sure the gown looks good for you that way. When it comes to you doing the reconstruction work and, and doing sewing, I think you'll find that you can probably actually do quite a bit. Um, because Again, so long as all of this sits nicely, that's really what matters. And you're going to make those stays adjust to fit to your body. They should fit you. You don't fit them. They adjust and work around you and your body. Um, and so long as you're comfortable, I, th I think you'll be fine. There's also interesting things. When I used to actually work at American Duchess, we had a woman call and she wanted to talk about like accessibility in shoes. And what we actually found is that historically, <laughs> coming from her feedback, she said the shoes were actually a lot more accessible. Um, side lacing instead of top lacing, it's a lot easier to get foot in. Um, and also like buttons instead of laces could be a lot easier. Um, if you have the hook, you could do it that way. 
buckling also can make it a lot easier than dealing with laces. And so what we <laughs> unintentionally were like, wow, side lacing boots are really accessible, like really accessible. Um, and, and so, yeah, just kind of, it, it, without even, I think, really thinking about it, just the, the customizability of clothing in the past just makes it a lot easier to work with you. So I think, I'm trying, like, so for you, depending on what you were wanting to do, I would definitely kind of lean more towards like things that would lace both hidden lacing in the back, hidden lacing in the front, stomach or front, just so that way you can be as comfortable as you need and, and just and like making sure your sleeves can move. And then, yeah, just trim, just looking real good. And maybe not spend as much in fabric in the skirts. Maybe you make the skirts a little bit narrower so they're not taking up as much space and you're not sitting on them and making them as like all clumped up. And then all of a sudden you're like, what is digging into my butt? You know, and you're like, huh? like hiking it up. So that's what I would do. But, and that's something that you would see in the 18th century too. You know, I've never seen, I've never seen a gown that I've been able to, from the 18th century that I've been able to pinpoint that is like, oh, this person must have used a chair, a wheelchair. Um, but I can't say I actually have an 18, late 1870s gown. And I didn't realize this until we put her on the mannequin, but she had, the, the wearer had severe scoliosis. And when you're looking at her flat on the table, you wouldn't notice. But the moment that she went on a mannequin, everything was lower on one side. You could actually see the curve in the back of the bodice. And, and this gown was clearly custom made for her and it was made to accommodate her unique body. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was a lot easier, I think in some ways when it comes to clothing back then because you could work with the maker and make sure that it, it worked for you. You're welcome. And thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And I'll hug you when we're done. I'll put my mask on. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, the main thing, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. And if you could dress only in one decade for the rest of your life, what would that decade be? Uh, does it go off of what I like or what it looks good on my body? I don't know. So I'm gonna give you two answers. Um, what looks good on my body, what like, makes this happy, it's the Edwardian era like 1900 to like 1905, it was six. Cause this body's like, oh yes, <laughs> give me the husband. Uh, sorry, sorry, Kenna, uh, straight front corset. Kenna, don't kill me. Um, Espen's not a thing. That's not the word that they used, <laughs> straight front corset. Um, but what I like aesthetically right now, ooh, 1915 to 1920. Oh my God. So good. It's so good. It's so wild and crazy. And they got the hats and it's like post-World War One and like the Spanish influenza and everyone's like, we're all gonna die anyway. So make it pretty. Like <laughs> relatable, isn't it? <laughs> so I love the late teens. I love the late 19 teens. I think that the late 19 teens is those five years are the most fashion forward five years of the entire existence of Western fashion, period, end of discussion. Like we know we should study 1916 and be like, yes, this is amazing. The aesthetics of it all, the insanity of it all. Oh, so good. So yes, Hoka Termi goes 1915 to 1920. Body goes early aughts, 19 aughts, not 2000s. I did that. It wasn't fun. Yes. Uh, 
okay, in a 18th century skirt, side ties versus center back ties. Um, why why would there be a difference at whose request? Uh, mm -hmm. The maker, the customer? Both. It just depends. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it could just be whoever. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, back closing kind of makes more sense when it comes, like when you keep all of this smooth, because like if you have the knot and like sometimes people want to tie the knots right there and I'm like, don't do that. It'll look like you have like this weird thing coming, like alien. Um, it's, it's not gonna look good. Um, but like, it makes sense when we want to keep everything kind of laying smooth and nicely. Um, but then when it comes to accessibility, it's like, well, I don't know, but they still have to tie one in the back. So I think it just depends, personal preference, whether it's the maker or the customer, but usually the customer would make those sorts of decisions. Yes. How long, so you're talking 18th century. How long does it take to make a gown, including the um, under structures? Okay, so I can kind of answer this question, but I, I do want to make a couple of points. Uh, one, vast majority of the situation, you would not be having your stays made for you at the same time, right? Like you don't go buy a bra and then go wear that bra and go put on a new shirt, right? Unless like you were like, oh, I really got to get like this formal thing and I got to go get the special underwear and I'm going to hate every second of it because it pinches and it's weird and ouch and, oh, and this bra is like really old. So, but in most cases, you just go to the store and you buy the clothes that fit, right? Right. Okay. So just kind of keep that in mind. Stays, depending on what era we're talking about and how heavily boned they are, we're looking to, I think it's about like 60 to like 120 hours worth of work. Um, so that's a, that's a lot. Um, shifts, women's shifts could be made, I think, the average time we kind of calculated for that, it's probably around like 24 hours. However, shifts and shirts can be purchased ready made um, because basic seamstresses, which is something I didn't talk about in the, in the, in the um, lecture, seamstressing was an unskilled labor at the time. So anyone could sew seams, sew seams, right? Everyone in this room would know how to sew seams. So everyone in this room would be a seamstress or a seamster. And so if you were not trained in a trade, but you wanted to make some money, like sewing up shifts and shirts would be an easy way to do that. So we had in London, they had this industry where pe that's what people would do. They would just show, sew up shirts and shifts. And then you can basically import them ready-made into the, into the colonies and you can buy them in like packs of six or 12 or something, right? So just like we buy our underwear today, Hanes. Um, fruit of the loom. Um, so... So we're looking at like 24 hours or so for a shift because your linen garments are gonna, the ones that get the most wear and tear, they're the ones that protect the outer clothing from our bodies. And this filth gets all over the shifts, right? It's nasty. And those are the things that get washed. So those are the things that have to have the best stitching in them. So that's why it takes so long is because they're very small stitches and very securely sewn. So 24 hours for a shift, let's say 80 hours for a pair of stays. Under petticoat, I can make that in about three hours. Um, and I'm not as fast as I used to be. And then a gown, kind of like that one, 10 hours, 12 hours worth of work. Um, a sack, like what we saw for endangered liaisons, we're looking at probably closer to about, I think, 20 to 40 hours worth of work. Depends on how much trim there is. Um, it doesn't mean that it takes one person that long. Obviously, you can have multiple people working on it, and usually there were multiple people on it, so you could have a very fast turnaround time. It is completely possible to hand sew an 18th century gown and petticoat in a day. You might need a couple people working on it, but it's completely possible. So, um, so yeah, it just sort of depends on how fancy it is and how long it takes. But yeah, this, yeah, no, that takes ten hours. So that's it. It's very simple. You're welcome. Other questions? Oh well, I'm gonna go back here. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, what about knitwear in this time period? Um, so in the 18th century, knitwear is not as much of a thing. I mean, you like mittens and, and, and stuff. You do see hats and caps that men wear that are knit. Um, you do see, um, you see machine knit fabric. So knit breeches were a thing. You see machine knit fabric being used for hair cushions and rolls. Um, obviously stockings are, are machine knit, um, but you're not kind of seeing like the outlander, right? 
that's a very outlander thing and not really an 18th century thing. However, I'm not an expert in this time period, but I just saw, so Jane Malcolm Davies, who's a part of the Tudor Taylor group, she's been working on her PhD, I believe it's in Denmark, and it's actually about Tudor knitting, which is really cool. And like Sally Pointer has been doing like a lot of reconstruction work for her. And like they just did a post actually about like knit sleeves. I don't know if you saw that. Did you see that? Oh, it's really cool. Um, and like, yeah, so like knit sleeves for women for like the Tudor era and, 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 and like knit caps and like that have been folded and stuff. So you definitely see it. I think it just kind of goes in and out of fashion. And for whatever reason, the 18th century just wasn't big on knitting. Um, especially like home knitting, that wasn't really a thing. Um, but knit fabric did exist, people did use it. Um, just not in like a really cute, like scarf sort of way. So. Another question? Yes? Hand, hand. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. webinar. I was asked about the timing, answering the timing question, whether or not that was by machine or by hand. And the answer is by hand. So yeah, the uh, purple gown that's out on display, I made that in probably about like yeah, 10 hours or so. Hands on, no machine. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so the question was, in the 1760s, would they have had pockets in their gowns, or in the 18th century, they had separate pockets, and would they have had pockets in the movie gowns? Um, 18th century, yes, and they also would have had, like, pocket hoops, so yes, pockets were definitely accessible, people wore them, they were great. 10 out of 10 recommend separate pockets, that's so good, such a good way to do it. I don't know if they had more pockets in the Dangerous Liaisons movie. I The blue gown, I don't think, has any such thing, but wasn't... Notorious, doesn't Michelle Pfeiffer like stick her hands in her pockets in one scene? She probably, like, I mean, stuck look. their hands in all sorts of places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was pockets. <laughs> it has pockets, pocket size. So, yeah. It is 620. I don't know if um, people want to go and go? look at the, would take one more question? Yes, one final question. Oh, Anyone have their hand up? I can't see any. Oh, okay, there's one. Hi, Ken. <laughs> okay. Do you want to repeat? What's the most difficult dress you made? How long did it take you? And what was the most challenging aspect of that dress? Um, probably the one that I just finished, which is the 1904 uh, evening gown made out of silk satin with the silk and with the silk gauze and net overlay. Um, the actual like cutting and construction of the base itself wasn't bad. It was just silk gauze and net and mitered edges on a skirt and a really stupid tight deadline because I'm a masochist <laughs> in a video that I didn't have to edit about it. Um, so yeah, that was the biggest thing. And that's honestly the nicest thing I think I've ever made. Um, and it, it's definitely the most expensive thing I've ever made. But I think that one, just because it really, really pushed my patience and it required me to be precise and it required me to think like, a couturier versus an 18th century mantua maker who's like, I don't care, <laughs> um, which is a great mindset to be in. Um, so that one, I think definitely, and part of it was just just the deadline that I was working in. Like, I think if I had, had give, been able to have more time, it would have been fine. But, you know, I'm dealing with satin, silk satin, which is beautiful, but it's also a asshole so mean and because it's like one wrinkle you know and it, you can't escape it it's just there but like this close wrinkle you move in them like that's what happens um and just trying to make sure that it laid properly and making sure like yeah matching up the mitered corner of the lace and having to stitch all that down like just really you could I couldn't cut corners you know I had to really focus and my hands are still recovering from it and then I had to turn around and make that purple gown for Williams Burke last week. I can't tell you guys what I was doing, but it was really cool. You guys can watch my channel like 
I can't say, I really want to tell you what I was doing last week, but I can't tell you, but you'll find out really soon. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it was that one, but I'm extremely proud of that. Like, I'm very proud of, of that one. Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much to our speaker, Abby. Thank you for coming. Um, Yes, I urge you once Clara has made her closing remarks, Abby's got some pieces in the, the lobby out here and you've also got a few more minutes to catch um, the last half hour of the um, exhibition. I think the museum's open today till seven. So thank you for coming. So Clara, you've got some things. Okay. Yeah, so we invite you all to experience this exhibit in person. The galleries will remain open until 7 p.m. this evening and the exhibit Exhibition will be on display through November 14th. We also invite IU students to RSVP for a student exclusive conversation with Galena Olmsted, Assistant Curator of European and American Art. Uh, this today's talk was proposed through our community creative program. Uh, congratulations to Kelly Richardson, who proposed this wonderful talk with Abby. Yes. Through our community creative program, we encourage IU and the local community to propose ideas for public programs at the museum. If selected, we will work with you to develop the idea into a program. Everything we do is made possible by philanthropy. Thank you to our friends who have made gifts to our annual fund and special exhibitions fund. Their support enables us to share exhibitions and free programs like the one you've experienced today. If you have enjoyed this event or are just as excited for the show as we are, Please visit the museum's website to make a donation. Gifts big and small impact all of our students and broader communities. Finally, how was your experience? What worked well? What could be better? Your feedback helps make better experiences. We appreciate your feedback in a quick survey as you exit the webinar or by using the QR code here. From all of us at the Eskenazi Museum of Art, take care and have a good evening.